episode? I sure, I sure am. Hi, welcome back to the Brant History Happy Hour. I'm Natalie, and today we are going to take a trip back in time. Uh, Nathan, what's in the drink? So in the drink we have uh, an ounce and a half of vodka. We have half an ounce of Grey Marnier, and then we put a squeeze of lime, uh, top it off with some cranberry juice uh, in, your, in your martini shaker, give it a shake, and then dump it into a glass over ice and add your lime garnish. So, what's this drink called? This is called The Grand because this week's episode is all about the forgotten feud of the Ford. So, let's get started. Okay, so where does this whole story start? Okay, so if you have ever taken a socially distanced walk through Lorne Park, you might notice that there is not one, but two memorials that indicate where Joseph Brandt might have crossed the Grand River to establish Brandt Ford, uh, our city. So essentially, Joseph Brandt, what, or known as Tyendinaga, was a Mohawk military leader during the American Revolutionary War, and he was allied with the British. Yeah, they fought as part of Butler's Rangers. They sure did. So what ended up happening was following the war, uh, Haldimand, uh, Frederick Haldimand, granted six miles on either side of the Grand River for the uh, for Joseph Brandt and his people, or the Haudenosaunee, following the war. And so they came up from the States and they settled there, essentially. So this tract of land, uh, granted in 1784, has decreased, evidently because of settler colonialism, uh, but essentially the Six Nations, uh, who are the Mohawk, Onondaga, Oneida, Cayuga, Seneca, Tuscarora people, uh, traditional people of this land, along with the Anishinaabe and the uh, Atawandran people, uh, so we just got to situate ourselves here because that's important and obviously we owe our city's name to Tyendinaga as well. So essentially, that's how you get the story of Joseph Brandt coming up in 1784 and crossing that Grand River. Okay, so why do we have two memorials? Great question. It's actually because of a turf war between the Brandt Historical Society and the Imperial Order of the Daughters of the Empire. So essentially, what ended up happening was that the IODE, we'll call them, placed one memorial and the BHS, or the Brandt Historical Society, placed another. So I just want to remind people that the Brandt Historical Society, that's us, woo! was formed in 1908 and also the IODE so essentially who they were were that they were this voluntary women's organization uh, following the Boer War they sort of wanted to spread this patriotic ideals of empire and so essentially we just have to kind of recognize that they really pushed a white British identity but nonetheless they are a part of this story. The Historical Society and its president, Mr. Passmore, first started to talk about the memorialization at a society meeting in April 12, 1912. So a discussion took place regarding a memorial to actually label where this Ford was. So like any organization, a committee was struck to learn where the original fording was. First, they interviewed Frank Cockshut of the Parks Board in order to acquire a piece of property at the site of Brant's Ford for park purposes. Then they sent a request to the mayor. So how did they figure out where the Ford was? What was like, how did they come up with their first guess as to where it would be? So the society's first guess was that it was on the east side of Gilkison Street, and it was sort of known as the Unnumbered Lot. So essentially, this guy named F.D. Rebel, uh, he said, 
well, it's near the THB bridge, like it's near that area. And essentially, because Revel was like the local historian at the time, he had written this amazing Brant Fortean history Bible, essentially, that was called like the History of Brant County by F.D. Revel. So he was able to confirm from his book where it was. In this great big fat book, it's a great read actually, I highly recommend, is the oral history of Miss Annie Thompson. So she was born in 1823 and she has this great early history of the area. So that's what Revel points to for where he thinks that the fording was. So essentially the committee compiles this report in 1913 and they go and they get ready to submit it, but then nothing happens. You don't hear about the BHS wanting to do this till February 1st, 1922. So what the heck? It's like, what happened there? Uh, so not too great for them, but good for us because there's actually more to the story. Also, the memorial didn't actually end up being erected till 1932. So we got a lot to cover here. But a dude named Colonel Leonard, who was a part of the Brant Historical Society, gets the ball rolling again. And he's like, come on, guys, let's get it together. He's essentially like a historical hype man, really. So he suggests getting acquainted with the Memorial Association of Ottawa to help out with getting this place marked. So they write to Ottawa and say, hey, we're from Brantford, like Brantford, named after Joseph Brant, huh? See the connection? And we need to mark where this original place was. So that's when Mr. J.B. Harkin Esquire, a commissioner of the Historical Parks Branch and member of the Historic Sites and Monuments Board, enters the story. Harkin was your typical bureaucrat. He would get to see all of the different types of memorials that people were proposing to erect. So he sat on this board, chilling in Ottawa, being like, yup that's significant to Canada's history, or nope, that's not significant to Canada's history. I'm your big heritage honcho. So part of the story takes place in Ottawa too? Yep, it's all over the map. So essentially Harkin in his, is in his big comfy office in Ottawa, and so he actually writes to uh, Dr. James Coyne, who is the Southwestern Ontario rep, uh, for the board in Ottawa. So essentially what he says to Coyne is like, okay, we're either going to mark this place with a cairn or we're going to mark it with a boulder. And I don't know why those were the only two options, but whatever, we're going to roll with it. But the crazy thing is, is that as these two are conversing, they're not telling the BHS any of this. Like they're just talking about it between each other. And like the Historical Society doesn't hear any decision that they're making about what this memorial is going to look like. So, classic bureaucracy, eh? So, Mr. Harkin was like to the BHS, Okay, so what is the deal with this place? This Brant's Ford, get me that data. So, a new Brant Historical Society president, there was a lot, by the way, by the name of Mr. Rowe was the new top dog. So he has to go and investigate and prepare a report about the historical significance of the Ford. So he strikes a committee composed of Mr. Passmore, the past president, and Mr. Revel, the local historian, to immediately form a local space force. Just kidding. It's a historian task force. Okay, so what does this task force do exactly? So, in 1924, some newspaper articles explode because they're like, Woohoo! Our memorial is important again! Yay! First we got the Bell Memorial, now we got the Brant's Ford Memorial, our civic identity is on fire, baby! High five! Socially distanced, though. But essentially, the BHS was busy, 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 and the expositor was like, this is so great. And then even the Globe was like, oh, the Brant Historical Society is trying to do this thing. 
and they interviewed Miss Annie Thompson. She got a little shout out in the globe, like how sweet that little old bitty. So, Rebel interviews Annie Thompson again, but this time she's 101 years old. And Rebel's like, we found our informant bright and cheerful with a memory remarkably clear. But of course they did, because she's kicking butt. So, Annie was like, it is not far from where the TH Bridge now stands and that a fame tavern used to be located nearby. So, they end up writing this report with Annie's testimony yet again for December 1924, sending it off to Ottawa to await the fate of the Ford. So, they were also kind of doubting themselves. Essentially, they went to the Six Nations and they asked them, like, where is this place? And so they were like, oh, well, it's near Fort View Court. That's where they identified it. So why didn't they think to ask? the First Nations before this. I know. Classic settlers. Anyways, essentially, they got this additional history from the Six Nations, and you also would have just thought that Rebel would have asked them when he was writing his book. Like, could have had a V8. A letter dated December 31st, 1924, from a General Cruikshank, who was also on the board of the Historic Sites and Monuments in Ottawa, writes to Harkin, being like, So, we don't really know if this is actually an important national site, and the BHS should just mark it themselves, so let's just do, let them do their thing. But also, the historic board was pretty much only meeting once a year, and they kept deferring the discussion of the Ford. They're like, next meeting, next meeting, next meeting. Okay, so what's happening in the meantime? Okay, so essentially, the thesis is that committees suck. But anyways, what ends up happening is that there's a whole bunch of mixed messages Nobody knows who's advocating for what, and they don't receive a communication until May 1927. Like, so long. Essentially, like, the Brand Historical Society, they thought that they were going to have this fancy new memorial to host the Ontario Historical Society in earlier that, in 1927, but that fell through. So it was mid-1927 when they finally get the communication from Ottawa, took them long enough, that uh, Brant's Ford was declared national importance. So the Brant Historical Society passed through multiple presidents by the time that that motion got passed. But a memo in Ottawa a couple weeks later said that the site would be marked in 1932. But they didn't tell the Brant Historical Society that that was going to happen. Anyways, Ottawa writes to the Brant Historical Society saying, oh, well, where do you want to put it? Because that depends on the type of tablet that we agreed to pay for. But they didn't say that they were going to plaque the boulder in 1932. Sneaky, sneaky. The Brant Historical Society response was, okay, we'll take the bronze tablet. But, like any classic government story, Ottawa asks for more information and wants Coyne to go to Brantford to figure all this stuff out. So, some time passes, Coyne takes a while to get the info that Ottawa needs, but he eventually comes to Brantford being like, oh, sorry, I was in Muskoka, and goes and surveys with Mr. McFadden, another new president of the BHS, and Mr. Whale, who was a local artist and part of the Whale painting legacy. So, Coyne's like, okay, I see what's going on here. Let's do a cairn for this thing. But then they start fighting about where the Ford was again. McFadden's like, no, 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 it's near Ford View Court. But Whale's like, uh-uh, buddy, it's in the area of Kirby Island, north of the Lorne Bridge. Duh. So... McFadden writes to the city being like, hey, we want 25 square foot, please, transferred to the Crown. He also taught at Brantford Collegiate Institute, so his hands were a bit tied, and that's why some of the delays were happening, I think, during this time. But anyways, 
The other reason why they thought it was around this area was that Six Nations had also planted trees to commemorate those who died in World War I on each side of the road leading from Gilkison Street to the dump that was there at the time. Okay, so what happens after Coyne comes to Brantford? After he comes and makes his suggestions, the society still kept doing research and then another possible fording place was identified near the Mohawk Chapel. But essentially, because the society couldn't get their act together, in Ottawa, they're waiting for all this information so they can go forward and it just kept getting yet again deferred, deferred, deferred. So... That is when the notorious Mrs. Brown enters the picture. Mrs. Brown was a member of the branch chapter of the IODE. She was a feisty woman, I will give her that. She was technically acting independently of her chapter 2 when she submitted this separate proposal to mark the site of the river crossing as a local and independent effort. She wasn't doing what the historical society wanted to do, which was making it a national historic site, but she was basically just letting Ottawa know that she was doing her own thing and that she was going to get it done. And supposedly she didn't really get this thing motoring until June 1929. She was also like, money was being raised and that my efforts started before the BHS. In the midst of the BHS waiting to hear certain directions from Ottawa, Mrs. Brown was like, you men aren't doing anything, and I'm getting all this work done by myself. <laughs> I mean, get on the woman. But here's the funny part. She was actually a former secretary of the Brand Historical Society, so we got a little bit of drama here. Essentially, she was really embittered, and really, she was apparently fired for declining to perform her duties, but it's not actually recorded what she did. Also, she happened to be the secretary in 1912 when they were planning the monument in the first place. How sneaky! So, Mrs. Brown solicits the help of the MP of North Brant, who was Franklin Smoke. And he writes to Harkin being like, she's planning on erecting this sundial. But Mrs. Brown didn't think that was good enough and ends up writing to Harkin herself being like, well, actually, just so you know, this is all a local effort, but also just want to let you know that we're doing this. Okay, thanks. Bye. So suddenly Harkin is faced with two proposals, the one from Mrs. Brown and the one from the Historical Society. So, Mrs. Brown writes to Harkin again in August 1929, being like, We interviewed Mr. Muir, president of the Historical Society. He said that the ladies were being absolute rockets for getting Brant's Ford off the ground. Mr. Harkins, we have rather unique plans. She also, like, spelled his name wrong every single time, but whatever. She also said that she had the support of some Brantford pals like Augusta Gilkison and Judge Hardy. But the best part is that there's absolutely no record of the three of them approving Mrs. Brown's proposal in the first place. So also you have Ottawa writing to her, like Mr. Harkin being like, oh, okay, like how much is this gonna cost? Like, what are you thinking about doing? Like entertaining her letter writing essentially. And so at one point he's actually like, Okay, well, we can consider giving you a standard tablet for your memorial. Wow, what a woman. I know, right? Mrs. Brown knew her communication channels. She knew the mayor, she knew the city engineer, she knew the parks board, all these people, right? So what she ends up doing, Nathan, is that she writes this expositor article being like, I am putting up a sundial. Like, she writes this expositor article all by herself and gets it going. And it's like, let's talk about the sundial also for a second, right? So, it's stone, because it's the oldest method of denoting time. She also wanted English copper, because the English were modern, and copper is a modern piece. It's also like, 
yeah, there's a lot going on here that definitely needs some more unpacking. So we're still in the late uh, 1920s then? Nope. Nope. Nathan, we're moving on to the 1930s. This thing stretches out, right? So what ends up happening is that it's 1930, then the blow hits! What ends up happening is that the list of memorials to be erected in 1932, which was Brant's Ford, they're like, yep, we're going to do this. It gets replaced with Fort York because they're getting all this information from Mrs. Brown being like, I'm doing my sundial. And the VHS being like trying to get all their research and everything to have this proper tablet and to have everything right. And so what ends up happening is that because they're doing this, the BHS doesn't hear from Harkin for years. So June 1930, they finally figure out that Mrs. Brown is erecting this sundial. They're like, what the heck? Exactly. So what they end up doing is that they reach out to the IODE and they say, let's figure this out. Let's, let's talk, let's talk society to a chapter, figure it out. So what ends up happening is that the chapter is like, well, it looks like Mrs. Brown's doing her own thing. And so essentially they sort of reconcile and this woman from the chapter, Mrs. Reed, absolute gem, writes this letter trying to explain everything and clear the air. But good God, then Harkin stokes the fire again because he writes to Mrs. Brown saying that Ottawa is going ahead with the other memorial and that just explodes Mrs. Brown. She starts writing to Harkin like crazy, just going off. Also, I don't really know if he was just having a good time receiving her letters, but he replied every time. So this feud continues on and on for a couple years where you have this triangle of Brown, Brant Historical Society, and Harkin. Okay, so what's Coin up to now? Our pal Coin, he's actually gone now. So there's actually a new guy in town named Professor Fred Landon. So he was actually a professor at uh, Western University. And so he was the new Southwestern Ontario rep. So essentially in May 1932, he's like, okay, I gotta go in and investigate this Brantford situation. So he gets there and he draws up a sketch of what he sees. So he also sort of identifies the probable fording as well. But essentially when he gets there, he's like, okay, so the society already placed the boulder because I don't blame them. They're sick and tired of waiting. And also Mrs. Brown's got her tricks up her sleeve, so they gotta get it down, right? So the society actually um, laid their boulder down in February, 1932, so a little bit earlier. But guess what else was there? The sundial. The sundial! So, this means that somebody, who knows who, either placed the sundial in uh, late April or early May. But the best part is, is that Mrs. Brown said that the mayor was informally storing the sundial while they waited for the city to lay the seed out for that spring because it was heavy and it was stone. I wonder what Mayor Davis has in his garage. Sundial, maybe? Who knows? <laughs> but essentially, what ends up happening is that in the 1950s, they have to move the memorials from their original spot to their uh, a different place because of the type of upkeep that was happening around where the memorials originally were. So we'll just never know. Will it be a National Historic Site? Couldn't tell ya. But nonetheless, join us next week as we continue to explore and walk through the past of Brantford's history. Cheers!